person. So tonight I'm going to talk about the um, Food Resilience Network in Canterbury. And it runs under two names, the Food Resilience Network, which we call the FRN. And then we run under a brand called Edible Canterbury. And I tend to use them both at the same time. So they're actually the same organisation. But Edible Canterbury is a brand of the Food Resilience Network. And um, I know a little bit about the background of some of you that are there tonight, just after talking to Alex about who the audience is. And it seems very similar to basically where we are in Canterbury. Uh, as was mentioned before, you know, Canterbury, we've had a bit of a tough old time. Um, and globally, obviously, and nationally, we've now had a, um, a real uh, the pandemic, COVID has made things really, really hard. And one of the things that was very hard within the community garden world was that um, a lot of community gardens couldn't open due to the COVID regulations. So we found some real challenges. So tonight I'm going to talk about how I'm involved in this space, um, how I see it through my lens, but also from an, um, our organisation's point of view. So um, bear with me. I'm, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Alex, is, she might feed them through to me on my screen. I've got a few slides which I'll talk to and I'm, so I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, yeah, this is there. So by, by day I'm a writer and I work in the garden. By night I try to... So my, my, my computer's telling me the host has disabled me from participating in screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay, should work now? Can you try? Yeah. Okay, um, share screen. Yeah, cool. Okay, where do I want to go? Um, I'm going to go to that one. And I'll just put it on here. Okay, so can you see the, the first slide says growing? Now I can't see you at all. Mm, yeah, we can't see the screen either. You can't see my screen? No. Okay. Should work. Uh, Let's try that one. Share this one. Okay, now it's working. Perfect. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so um, unfortunately, just, oh, actually, is that better? Can you yes. see that? Is it, full, is it full screen now? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is me. My, my life has been up the garden path for a very, very long time. I have terrible fingernails. And um, I really struggle not to do something in the garden every day. I'm, whether I'm sowing a seed, pulling out a weed, um, picking something to cook, I kind of um, have been really lucky to fall into an industry which I love and it's also my vocation. So I might have met, because I can't see you, I, I don't know who I know and who I don't know. However, um, I love what's going on in Taranaki. I love the fact that this, um, the, the Taranaki Garden Festival has just got this momentum and energy and passion that pulls, you know, like-minded people all together to show off what you've got. And it's, it's phenomenal. And I've been looking at some slides that Alex sent through, just giving me a flavor of what you guys are doing up there. And it is impressive. Um, and it feels like there's a groundswell of energy towards growing your own food, networking, sharing, and enabling, um, enabling growth. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. So this, this is me. Um, I work in the community garden space a lot. I've developed community gardens. I'm an ambassador for them. Um, but I'm here tonight with my food resilience hat on. But because I'm connected in so many other spaces, it actually gives me a real clarity about what's going on within the food and gardening and horticultural space in public places within our region. So the um, second one down, I'm a um, board member and active member of the Canterbury Community Gardens Association. We have 37 community gardens around our region. And this would be the most active group in our region, like the Food Resilience Network, we're active, but we are nowhere near as engaged as the community gardens are. Um, absolutely phenomenal places, totally under-resourced, but they, have, they all have an energy that 
it is kind of, it's formidable. You know, you get one or two people that are passionate about plants and wanting to grow food and encouraging people to come in to feed families that can't. You, you, it's really hard to destroy that passion and energy and that's what community gardens have in bucket loads. However, because they're really um, under-resourced, sometimes it's the same people that are kind of using all their energy and we need to look after the people that run our community gardens. So I'm really passionate about enabling that. Uh, I've also been on the Horticultural Society for a long time. I've recently stepped down. Um, I've just picked um, the Christchurch Public Hospital. We've just built a new hospital. and I've got no funding for the garden. So I've just picked this up as a project as a volunteer to manage the development of the, of the garden in the public hospital. And I'm a director of uh, the Gardening for Good, which is a, a charity that basically enhances and uses people's spare time to activate key projects. So um, that's kind of me. Um, when I first got into the food resilience space, I managed a community garden in Christchurch. And after I'd been there a year, this is the produce I picked one day. And if you can see on the back, wall of the shed it says free vegetables so this food was free for anyone that had a need and it is amazing watching people when they start growing food together the energy that it builds the confidence that it builds a lot of the people that were in this involved with this garden were marginalized um, either physically mentally or emotionally or maybe um, all three a number of them had very colored backgrounds and this was a garden where everyone was welcome, no matter where you'd been, um, what you'd done in society, you were able to come and grow food and then cook and share food together. And this is kind of where my absolute, once I started working l grassroots, literally with, alongside these people, I just realised how important food was. And I'd kind of taken it for granted my whole life. So... I, w I managed this project for three years and they, they, there was a token honorarium and when they ran out of funding, I couldn't justify spending three days a week there as a volunteer. So it meant I kind of had to move on. I'm still very connected to this space and I often, people, com companies donate me things, so I take them around and give them to this garden. It's, it's a phenomenal place. So that's kind of where I got my handle on the need for the supply of fresh food and vegetables and teaching people healthy habits, but also teaching them how to garden, um, how to grow their own food, how to connect with nature, and also how to connect with themselves. Now this might sound like a health message, but it, it actually is. Um, and it, but it's really important to sort of kind of understand that and keep your passion gr growing, literally. So yeah, I think there was, Thirty different vegetables there that day, so I was pretty. It was a proud moment. Oh yeah. So this is just the photo, another angle, but you can see the people in the back of this photo. The two gentlemen that are sitting down were from a a village, um, a healthcare village, and these two chaps hated the garden, but they always wanted to come each week, and they wouldn't pick up a tool. They would just sit there and talk about some lady in the kitchen, um, who I never met, but they um, loved coming and they always wanted to sit on that seat. If they couldn't sit on that seat, there would be a problem. And then the people behind them in this photo are from other gardens. So this, this community garden, when I was that year, we had 28 different allotments um, for the 28 different groups of people. Some groups may have 20 people in a group, some people may only be two or three. And we, the, the trust, the Waiora Trust, we would charge them $100 a year and we would give them free seeds and free plants and free gardening advice. So it, um, every three months we would have a harvest lunch and we could have three or 400 people there and we would um, cook and use the produce from the garden. So it was a phenomenal connector. And then after the earthquakes, th these spaces became even more important. So it was post-earthquake that 
the Food Resilience Network came about, um, we were a, a region, a city on its knees. Um, we barely had water. Uh, we were really struggling for food because we couldn't freight it in. So I'm just checking my notes as I go along. Um, that was, uh, yeah, it was, we started life in 2013. And we were a collective um, group of people, like-minded, that were like, gosh, we've, if we can grow food, why don't we, why, why don't, can we not grow enough food for our region? Some people can't get to food. We, we could, let's see if we can drop it off. Um, the council were like, gosh, we need to make some of this land that's probably not going to be able to be used again for housing. We um, should consider opening it up for the growing of food. So that all these conversations were kind of happening. And there were a couple of hillies, well, actually there were a number of them. And um, there was a group in Christchurch called um, Soil and Health. And it was led up by a couple of key people who some of you may know, um, a guy called Matt Morris and a guy called Bailey Perriam. And they were passionate in this space. And they um, organized hillies and meetings with anyone that had anything to do with the food space. And there was, a, there was a need to basically share and get together uh, to enable basically food security because we, we felt very, very vulnerable as a city because we, we, our normal food streams had dried up or they were becoming really expensive. So we started um, community gardens really, um, I think before the earthquakes we had like 22, 23, now we've got 37. Um, there's some issues with getting more land for community gardens, but the community gardens provide a power of food. But then there's also the commercial growers that were actually working in the region. They were growing produce to send all over the country, but we couldn't get it out because the trucks couldn't get in. So they had, an, they had surpluses of things, all sorts of edible crops. And they, they, their options were either to dump it or try and find a network where we could share them. So lots of things happened literally it was like a crisis it was it was worse than COVID because we had we had very poor communication initially because there were you know um, in the early days you know some people didn't have water and their phones um, electricity was not always there so it was it was very 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 raw and uh, warlike so out of that the conversations it was like well we need to work together to try and um, mitigate these issues happening again if there was a potentially more quakes so the council and some other key um, government agencies were basically like, well, what, how can we support it? And they helped us create um, the structure for a charter. Um, and we called it the Edible Charter. And that is where the key stakeholders all basically signed an agreement to say, we believe um, food resilience is important to our city and we would like to be involved and let's try and create a framework to make it happen. So there's over a hundred signatories on our charter and I'd really encourage you as a region to engage with everyone, everyone from schools to community gardens to uh, through to food banks, um, anything in the food space, transport companies, logistics, everything so you can get your message across about what you're trying to do and you're investing in your people. So we went through that process and from that we um, had to create an organisational structure. So we've got a governance body, which is where I sit, and you can also be a member. So for example, my, um, you know, my brother could join up as a member of the Food Resilience Network, pay $20 per year and have the um, ability to come along to member functions, um, hillies, um, demonstrations, that kind of thing. So you don't need to be working in the space to be part of the space. And then the last thing I've got down here, which we're involved with, is the Otakaro Orchard. And I'll talk a little bit about this. It's, um, within Canterbury, it's quite a polarizing topic, but it's something that's quite key for us, um, which I'll mention. So have we got, am I good to keep carrying on? You can all hear me okay? Yep. Yeah? Yep, okay. So essentially, these are the notes literally that I've just talked to. Um, basically, communities, we need to look at new ways to connect with each other. And basically, we had, to, we had to rebuild our city from the ground up. 
So Edible Canterbury, this is our brand we run under, is a project created by the EFRN, the Food Resilience Network. And it's all about having access to healthy, locally produced food. Like we know where it comes from, we can feed and sustain ourselves. So we're literally the connector in providing information on growing food, fostering community connections, and supporting local foraging. Now, foraging was, um, was, it was a good thing that kind of came out of, um, out of the earthquakes in a way, because when some of the houses were pulled down, they left, they left the trees, they left the, um, the fruit trees and the citrus trees. So you can literally, um, you can get local free fruit in some of these spaces, which is, which is pretty awesome. And we recently had a, a hui only a week ago to look at what the food resilient organisation we need to be doing. And it, one of the resounding messages was, we really want to, to have a city where we can basically pick, we, we can pick afternoon tea off the tree. Literally, we can walk around the city, never take more than you need, but we could p pick an apple for afternoon tea. So um, it, that's not necessarily foraging, but it's food for free. And for that to work in our city, um, we know we need to get community groups activated and looking after the trees. Um, we need to encourage community groups never to take more than they need. You know, just take something for one feed. You know, we need to eliminate the greed. So it's, we need to educate our public on that bit. That's pretty much what we're about in a nutshell. So this, this is our network. And I'm kind of looking at my clock, which and I think I've got to be done by 6.30. So I'm kind of, this is where we're at. So we're a network of 30 organisations and that's made up of um, local government, so the Christchurch City Council. We have got our sponsors. Uh, these are people that have been helping us with our building project. Um, we have got had lotteries. Um, we've had a grant from lotteries for our orchard project, also from the Rada Foundation. We um, have a, a number of social networks which we work with, community gardens being one, horticultural society being another, um, Germinate, which is a collective, um, uh, a, a collective produce. Um, company which is very good. We've got 780 parks. So there's a lot of green space in Christchurch and for anyone that's flown in to the area in the last five years there's even more green space than we've ever had. Um, this here says 35 community gardens but we've actually got 37. We've got 70 edible school gardens within our city. We've got I think 280, um, 280 schools so we've got 70 that have dedicated edible school gardens. Um, I'm on a real mission to double that figure. Uh, we've got four food forests and at, at the date of this number, 26,000 fruit trees on public land. Um, that was, that, that data was from uh, I think August. There might be a few more now. Um, actually there definitely will be because there have been some Department of Housing properties which have been um, knocked over and they're being rebuilt and they are, have re rehomed a lot of the fruit trees from the um, government housing areas. So that, that figure will be bigger than 26,000 fruit trees. And then we've got our people. Um, there are so many people that are passionate about this space that, that really want to work together to provide fresh, good food that's, that's nutritious, but also nurtures the soul in the community and connects with people. And people really want to tell their story. They want to share their story. We've got a guy, a young chap, his name is Zane Croft, and he dug up his boom in front of his house and it's like, I'm going to feed people. It caused a big bit of a ruckus within the council. And he's trying to get a momentum called Edible Streets. In the end, the council let him stay. Um, and he provides very, very low cost, very good organic produce, like a salad bag for $2. And you know, it would barely cover his costs, but he's passionate about it. He's passionate about teaching people that good food doesn't come out of a plastic bag or a paper bag. So yeah, it's people like him that are pretty special. So I've pretty much covered this off. Um, but that last piece there, 
we, we totally see it's our role to connect community with businesses, um, with education and, and the public sector through growing and preparing food while sustaining our lives and the environment. That word sus sustaining, sustainable is very much a key word within our region. Um, it's, it's about sustaining the environment, but also our own health, our emotional health and wealth, and wealth not as in financial. Um, we need to literally fuel ourselves from the inside with good food, surrounded by good people and a good environment. So um, resilience is not just about the food, it's about, it's about the whole package. So um, this is the structure of our, of our network. So we have uh, five board, uh, six board members actually. Um, so we have a chair, secretary, treasurer, committee members. We all either work in this space or are connected in the space. So um, the top six there, that's the board. We meet once a month. And then we have these advisors, which are on the bottom three lines. Now these, it is phenomenal that we have a group that has advisors from these um, organisations. So we've got Tony Moore. He's the sustainability advisor from the Christchurch City Council. He has been a pioneer within this whole um, development of the FRN. He's been right there from the start and he has enabled a lot and for the enable, um, has enabled the FRN to literally develop, survive. So he's, a, he's an anchor man. So he's an advisor. Then the next two, we've got Beck Carey and Tim Weir. They are from community and public health. So they work with um, all ages and stages of people and are very well connected with the schools and education and healthy eating, which is a big, big um, key component for what the FRM want to be able to enable. And down the bottom, we've got an absolute icon in, um, in the health space, and that's Hui Alambi. Uh, she's Healthy Families in Sport Canterbury. She is, she's just, whenever Hui is speak, she wants to listen. Um, she understands people, she understands process, she understands community. So those advisors feed directly into our board. So we've got a wide range of skills and also um, connections and community. So that's worked well for us. We've got a very strong board and team. Um, we have an AGM once a year and we run a set of accounts um, and we're a, we're a um, non-for-profit. So that's kind of our structure. And then this is one of our key projects. And because I can't see you, I'm not sure if many of you have um, followed this, but after the earthquakes, um, there was a lot of vacant land, particularly in around the inner city. And this is a spot near the PGG building and the old band road under and where a new big bridge is going in, um, in the CBD. So the FRN um, has been able to secure a lease for this key block of land to build a orchard and a food hub, which will be which will have a cafe, meeting spaces. So it is we're in a very very unique position where we've been granted a long term lease by the Crown to create a food hub, and it is phenomenal. So what's gone in first has been the start of the orchard. And then you can see from this picture here that there is a building. Now the building, um, we started the building and you can see here from this picture, all the framing and different trusses are up. We had to press pause because we had a funding issue. So it's, we're in quite a unique position to be a community group, um, the Food Resilience Network. Um, having the mandate and the ability to have such a large area of space collateral in the inner city. So we as the, the, the board of directors, we are very, um, very passionate about doing a good job here. So we've got a vision here of having a thriving orchard, community garden, a cafe that cooks the produce, people there that show you how to grow the produce, they've got composting toilets, um, water saving systems, we're going to have a green living roof on the building. Um, it, it, is, it is a phenomenal project um, and it has taken a lot of energy and a lot of resource and it came from an idea that probably started five years ago and it's, yeah, it's a lot of work that's gone into it. 
So we are aiming to be finished, oh, gravy, May or June next year. Um, the orchard's in and running, and I've got a couple of pictures of that. Oh, this is an aerial view. Um, so what we've just looked at is this is a building. I don't know if you can see my mouse on the screen, but um, yeah, we've got the building there. And then we've got all, all the, a lot of the orchards all been planted out. I've got some pictures of the, oh, that's another one of the building. Oh, that's the orchard. So the, these are some of the trees. So you can see from the size of these trees that, you know, they're three, four, five years old. So by the time we get the building up, we're actually going to be, you know, having a fresh supply of pears, nectarines, almonds, um, Jerusalem artichokes. We've got, um, we've got a lot of things on the ground, but we are nowhere near where we need to be. So that's just um, some of the orchard there. Yeah, I think I've got. Uh, so my next image here is, um, this is, I'm starting to talk now a little bit about cultivating community. So these are a couple of women that work in different community gardens and the food resilience, we're really well connected to community gardens. And one of these ladies is a total volunteer, the other one is a paid coordinator. And they, um, they both put the exactly the same amount of effort and energy into what they do. And they're all about creating environments where people have a space and a place. So we are very fortunate in Christchurch to have and I'm sure you guys are the same, where you've got really passionate people that want to share and, and they care and they want to create an environment where everyone has a space and a place. So this is just an image of um, these ladies working together to create a, a garden exhibit where the public came through and saw it. So if you kind of think about events that you might have been to, like the Ellerslie Flower, the Ellerslie Flower Show, the, um, maybe the New Zealand Flower Show, Christchurch used to have an event and the community gardens and the Food Resilience Network, we would make displays and talk to the public about what we do. So it's really important um, and I'd really encourage you um, as you're developing what you're going to do is you need to take the people with you. You need to tell your story. So when you're at a barbecue on Saturday and people say, oh, what do you do? I kind of go, which hat am I wearing today? Am I talking about food resilience, community gardening? Am I talking about the new hospital garden? But you've got to get your barbecue chat going. You've got to say, hey, I'm actually working on this cool new project. And it's, it's all about food systems, growing resilience and feeding, feeding ourselves and our families. And, and be passionate about it. Every time you have a chance to talk about it, do. And find some kind of organisational structure that'll work for the the people that are the leaders and the pioneers within your organisations, within your groups. There'll be natural people that you that are um, that are obvious. Um, if they, if you know, hold on to them. Don't let them go. Don't let them put up a for sale sign outside their house. You know, keep them in your region and in, in your in your bubble to kind of to grow this. And the food resilience network. We've come up against a lot, a lot of challenges. And we've had to be really resilient and it's, it's um, kept the energy out of some people because things have been hard. But we're at a, in a position now where we're looking at, you know, who are we? Um, we, we don't want to cross over with any other organisations in our space. What's our relevance? Um, what's the where to from here? And part of that is we need to finish off our orchard project and we need to get that building finished. So once the building is finished, we'll be looking for tenants and the tenants of the building will provide our organisation income. Then we'll be able to look at what kind of resources we need to invest in to support our food systems. At the moment, we have had grants from different organisations, but nothing on a regular basis to give us a cash flow, which is hard in, in this space. Because you, it's very easy to very easy to overcook or um, deplete energy resources if there's no refilling of the energy. So that's why you've got to build each other up, look after each other, encourage people to join your movement and um, offer them the odd carrot. I just had to throw a pun in there somewhere. And 
enjoy it you know like as, as soon as it becomes hard work it, it takes the joy and passion out of it but when you, you know you've got a smile on your face and you say hey look come down we, we're actually turning the compost this weekend we've got the cafe down the road shouting us coffees we've got the bakery giving us some cake and we're going to make some seaweed fertilizer you know come down bring the family you know um give them reasons to come and uh, if you and if you've got a public space like where our orchard is in the city we've just started door knocking and introducing ourselves to all the neighbors and saying hey look you know if you fancy some pears for lunch they're ripe on the tree and they're like wow and they're like wow if you want a meeting room um we've got some spare space in our building until you get your building up if you want to use our rooms you're like oh great awesome so it's about chatting to all the people that are around you um, and letting them know what you're up to because there are often a lot of ways that people can help and what we've found in Canterbury is that we working together it, it, it is far more sustainable than trying to do everything on your own so connecting up all your groups and organizations has actually enabled the FRN to survive and um, we're now looking at what we need to do for the next five years 10 years 20 years um, so we're an organisation that's evolved through a crisis and we've got to survive to be relevant, to be sustainable. And the building and the orchard project will give us a platform to showcase what we do in the food resilience space. It will provide us somewhere where we can teach um, groups, schools, organisations, businesses, how to grow food sustainably, how to be aware of the environment, um, educate them on uh, things like organics, permaculture, understanding the cultural elements within a garden, within our city, within our region, within our country. It will be our platform. It will be our shot window to, to basically anyone that will come. So um, we see our role as being connectors to the food space and literally being like the, um, uh, the, the road you know, if you, if you want to know anything about the food space in Christchurch, if you want to know where the community gardens are, if you want to know where you can forage for free, if you want to learn about permaculture, if you want to learn how to make worm tea, or if you, um, you want to learn, watch someone cook, grow it, cook it, eat it, the, our, our environment in the city, the Otakara Orchard, will be a place to go. It'll kind of literally be the doorway to the networks. And that's what we see our role and purpose evolving into. So we've got... We've got a lot of work to do, a lot of work's been done. But just the, the power around our ball table is phenomenal. The energy is awesome. We all have different um, key skills. So um, getting to that stage was a, a real, that was a major for us. But it's, um, and, and being relevant as well has, been, has always been a bit of a challenge. So um, I really encourage you on your journey and, and stick with it. And I've, um, just as a wrap up, um, I'd like to invite um, all of you that are here tonight and other people that might be tuning in or listening. Um, if you'd like to come to Christchurch, I would gladly make myself available for a day to show you around what we do. And if you wanted to come as a group, um, marvellous, you know, there's, if you need some beds, it's the kind of thing we could bullet people out because that's kind of what we do. Um, we just look after each other and we want to nurture what we've got and we want to share what we've learned. We've had some challenges along the way, but we've also had a few really good milestones. So um, don't, you know, if um, you think I've got more to offer, feel free to check in, um, send me some questions and I can certainly talk to them from my perspective. But I'm only one of a team of people in the Food Resilience Network. So there's, there's more of us. We look at it from different angles. We have different lenses. But I really want to encourage and endorse what you're up to. And um, I'd love to come up and see what's going on up there. And apologies, I'm not there in person. Um, but it's just one of those things. But it's been nice to sort of spend the afternoon looking at the food resilience space. And like we've actually, you know, from a cluster of people that were just passionate about being able to grow food and make sure we had enough to eat, to what we've got now. We've got an organisation that is functioning, that is robust, We've found our funding for our building. Um, there's a real light at the end of the tunnel. That's amazing. 
but it's what happens when we get to the end of the tunnel, you know. Um, we've got to make sure we action, we do what we say we're going to do. So um, that, that's what keeps us real and true. It keeps us very focused on our deliverables. Is, and it will, you guys will probably find that too. You've got to be really, really all on the same page about what you want to try and achieve. And if you can all be on the same page, um, you'll have momentum. If you've got momentum, you're halfway there. So thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to answer anything off a question off the floor, if there's any, or I can just wrap it up. Thanks very much, Rachel. Thank you very much. If you can stay for some questions, I'm, um, I think the audience is keen to ask a couple. Thanks very much for that very inspiring and um, very warm um, discussion about the, the journey that you've been on and the position that you find yourselves in now. And I hope, I hope in part of that we don't need to suffer some sort of um, disaster. Um, Same. Same. To, 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 to end up in that position, I hope we can be quite proactive. Obviously, uh, another one of the big statistics in this part of the world is, um, you know, 50% chance of our mona erupting in the next 50 years. So um, we're just quite conscious of that. But uh, I just wondered if anyone had any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, first of all, to Rachel. And I will open up to questions while you've got some time. Rachel. Wow, there was a lot there. I picked up on worm tea and foraging and logistics, <laughs> all sorts of things. So it's pretty. I just wonder if there's any questions from the floor. Yeah, there's always one from Cal. Cal Freeman from Freeman Farms. Cal, do you want to? Hopefully, you can hear Rachel. I'll just pass the mic around. Uh, thanks, Rachel. That's, um, yeah, really inspirational. Um, one thing that I've noticed here is at the local council level or regional council. There isn't actually anyone whose responsibility is to cultural at the moment. There's no point in doing anything. So the council is very interested in different people are, but it doesn't really see anyone else portfolio. So what has been created in the like local or regional councils to um, connect into or is there also Okay, okay, I was gonna I'll, I'm just gonna try and summarize what I think you're saying, because it's it, it, it's kind of coming and going a little bit. Um, you... Rachel, can you hear better there? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so I think Carl was asking um, just about the role of um, regional or, or district councils in, um, in this whole area. And, yeah, okay. and what's, what's been your experience? Is there, is there a nominated person? Oh, well, you need, you need a champion. You need a champion that you can jump on the blower to that you can kind of go, hey, this is happening, or did you know this isn't happening? Um, you need someone who, you need to have the ear of someone. And what we're finding now is um, there are more KPIs for people in the um, councils that they're having to demonstrate um, food resilience, um, community resilience, and there have to be some, some um, some things that they can demonstrate that meet those targets. So they're kind of keener to listen to us now because we can like, well, actually, we 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 talk to this amount of people um, um, of you know our audience is ABC. This is what we're doing, and and they're actually having to listen a bit better. But you do need to have you need to have the ear of the right person. There's nothing worse than talking to the person at the bottom of the tree or that's on the wrong branch of the tree or that isn't even connected to the tree. So it's finding the right person. And if you can make your wheel really squeaky and um, look at what your, um, your long-term plans are for your region, your city, because we're very involved with that within Christchurch about what the long-term strategy is, you kind of need to get in on the ground. Like we need more open spaces. We need Whatever, you're, whatever you are really wanting to achieve, you know, is it that there's food for free? Is it foraging? Not, well, not foraging, but being able to pit fruit. Um, is it just having, making sure that when there are um, apartment blocks, or if you have big developments like we do, that, that they have community gardening spaces and places for people to go and sit and grow and be, literally just to be. And because the food, it doesn't only nourish, you know, our, our, our tummies, but it, it's the, the growing of it nourishes our, our body, mind and soul. And it's community resilience. It's that resilience that's more than just the food. Um, and I'd, I'd bang that, I'd 
just keep banging out that message because sooner or later someone's going to listen to you and actually you'll find they just need mechanism you need to say well if you did this this could be the outcome so find a deliverable that they need would be my advice Excellent, Rachel. Thank you very much. Alex was just asking if you could stop sharing your screen and we'll be able to see you a little bit larger, if that's possible. Um, can I just go oh, like That's okay, that's fine. Stop, oh, very stop very sharing, here I am. It's okay. Yeah, oh, hi. <laughs> um, and we do have a council up to the members on the, on the live stream tonight. There are a couple of members of council here, and I'll go to us. Um, Peter, if you're going to ask a question. I'll be very interested to find out about um, hospital gardens. I, I've had two operations this year, and I can show you that the food is having a big And there's so much gardens that they've actually got a master's degree in food security and climate change adaptation. But I just see all this green space here that food could be grown. I'm in contact with some people with the DHD, but What's a great way to sort of going about to get the hospital involved with actually having community garden space? So there's some fresh green food that's going into the food. Yeah, it's kind of, you've, um, I kind of find that where the power is, is, is where the people are. So you need to, you know, rep, rep, rep your, surround yourself with people that are all on the same page and create some momentum. Start sharing your voice and what you and what your deliverables will be. You know what will happen if you know what is the benefit of having a new community garden or greener space? So it's like there is there is so much evidence out there to back up um, putting in new gardens and more green spaces. And there are so many reasons. So don't don't be an audience of one when you have those chats. Take everybody with you. Use every connection you've got. Go and meet people that you've never met before that you need to know. Um, it is, you, you've really got to pioneer it um, and, and believe it. And that, that takes a bit of energy, to be honest. Um, but if you can find the right people, you can feed off them, literally. And it does become easier. And if you can get the council on the side for a shared vision, um, you're halfway there. Excellent. Thanks, Rachel. Hey, right, that answers your question. And we have actually, the same we have actually been there now. Contact with the Tarantula District Health Board here, and they were quite keen on um, getting involved in community gardens. And there was an initiative, I'm not sure if there's anyone from the, the doctors, the garden restriction doctors here this evening, I don't think you're right, but there is an initiative being kicked off to encourage community gardens for the well being of people and, and the doctor garden prescription here in Papua New Guinea. Um, Jane, you catch me up? I miss anyone else. Thank you very much for that inspiring talk. It was, it was excellent. Um, I was involved, I lived in South Auckland for a number of years and sat up quite a number of community gardens in South Auckland and um, yeah, brought the community together. But what I'd like to ask is I saw that in part of your, your talk about the community and businesses, I would like to know how. Would you get businesses involved with community gardens or the other way around? There seems to be, um, you okay, know. I just want to make sure. I'm... Did, you, did you catch the question? How did, oh, so the question is how, is how to get businesses on, on board with community gardens? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Is that right? Okay, so um, there's, in my, in my experience, um, it actually hasn't been hard. It has been literally, um, I invite them to a lunch, or I say, hey, look, do you guys want somewhere to ha have your, you know, your barbecue, your Christmas barbecue? Um, would you guys like to come down and, um, you know, because some, it's like larger businesses have to do, com uh, now actually do community works. I'm like, well, actually, if you guys are looking for a, a different way to use your um, voluntary hours. Maybe you could come down and volunteer at the gardens. Um, so they are all things that I've used a lot and have created lots of conversations. Um, and also, maybe an approach that I use a lot is like, might give them a ring and say, "Hey, look, it's Rachel from Waiwara here. 
Um, not sure if you guys know what we're up to, but th this is kind of what we do. And we're wondering if there might be anyone in your business that might um, have some capacity to volunteer or if you might have any products or if you've ever got anything that um, we might be able to use, you know, so if it's a timber company or if it's a, um, maybe like a cafe, they might have scraps which, be, which might feed your chickens or it might give you ingredients for your compost. Um, there could be, you might, it could be a manufacturing company and you might need some cardboard to, you know, I literally like, oh, don't suppose you guys happen to know anyone or you'd be interested in doing A, B, C, D, E, F. And if you can get them on site, you're halfway there. Um, if you can get them out of their chair, out of their desk, in their car, to where you are, um, they often want to do good. They, I, I haven't really struggled to build connections once you get people on site and they see what you do and the limited resources we have to do it with. Um, it, is, it is amazing once people understand. Like, for example, I've been in the horticultural industry my whole life. Um, last year, um, a company I've worked with for years, Tui Products, they manufacture potting mixes and fertilisers. They rang and said, Rach, I don't suppose you know anyone that could take 15 pallets of potting mix. I'm like, wow. Hey. I'm like, yeah, cool. Yeah, I've got 37 gardens. I'm like, sweet. We need one delivery point and um, you'll have to manage getting it from our distribution centre to your delivery point. It's like, holy moly. Um, so this product was um, outdated. So they wanted as an organisation to pass it on to groups and organisations that would use it. They know I work in this space. So when I'd seen the owner like two years ago, he's like, what are you up to? I'm like, oh, I'm in community gardening now. It's bloody awesome. And I'm like, so if there's ever anything, you know, don't, don't be chucking it away. Give me a ring. And that's kind of what happens. So on each pallet, there was 50, 50 40 litre bags of potting mix. And we had 15 pallets delivered one Saturday morning by a freight company, which we ended up getting that for free as well. Um, and when you talk about, you're not, talk, you're not asking for you as a person, you're asking for the community. You're kind of like, hey, we're a community garden. We actually feed 100 people. Um, or we're wanting to provide fresh food for X, Y, Z. You have your chat ready all the time to tell your story. Um, so it was a big logistical um, effort for us to, it's 15 tonnes of potting mix that was. Um, but this year they don't have the excess stock because the gardening is going gangbusters, but last year they did. So it was a phone call. I got rid of their problem. They gave us a phenomenal opportunity and um, we told um, every community garden that had a Facebook page showed the picture and tagged two products on it. Um, I'm also a journalist, so I wrote a few stories for newspapers, magazines. So Tui got some good profile. We got some amazing product and it grew some amazing plants. So um, let people know what you're doing would be my, um, let them know, say good day, and give them ideas of ways that they could help you um, rather than like, oh, do you want to help or do you want to sponsor? Just say, look, if you've got anything that's going to recycling or if you, it, we're often on the lookout for offcuts of carpet, whatever it could be that this business does, they probably just need to, to understand how you might be able to use some of their products. Um, tell your story would be my message. That's great. Right. Thank you very much, Rachel. Jane, did that answer your question? Yeah, and I know always might speak to it later, but Mark, how can you be able to your own? Tapping into every um, network we can at the moment, we're coming from real estate agents and um, return to earth, um, dropping off uh, um, compost and all sorts of things. Any last questions from anyone? I'm going to ask one, Rachel, if no one else has got one. If it's for you, you can. I've got one here from Heron Tangahau. Sorry, I apologize. Um, she's asking, or he's asking, does you have a link that we can uh, read up more about your co-papa um, and contact details? Um, he's from Gisborne and um, he's part of the Healthy Families East Cape team. Um, he's currently working on an initiative that is exploring how um, they might make this a food secure and solver region as well. Um, so she'd like, so he'd like to have your contact details, um, and that would be an advantage 
uh, for him to touch base with you. Did you get all that? Oh, no, that's fine. Actually, I've got, um, I do actually have a, 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 my last slide. I thought my last slide was the other thing, was actually how to, how, to, how to find out more about the Edible Canterbury. So there is, um, I'm very easy to find. So please do get in touch. Just Rachel Bogan, the happy gardener. You'll easily find me. Um, then I'll just figure out how to reshare my screen again. And... Um, Rachel, I think it's, what we'll do, we'll probably do actually, we'll share your details if that's okay on our Facebook page. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Good. So, um, so, yeah, share my yeah, do share my details. Alex has got them all. So I'm very, very happy to have a conversation and be in touch with anyone that thinks that I might be useful because it's all about paying it forward. It's all about making a difference. And I'm just sharing my experiences. Um, but I totally encourage you guys to get active um, and build on the energy that you're starting. And, um, yeah, if you ever need a bit of energy, just give me a yell because sometimes I've got, you know, I've got energy. But don't overclock each other. Thanks very much, Rachel. And thank you very much for making yourself available um, despite, obviously, our uh, personal constraints at the moment. Um, and the, the invitation is obviously open. You can visit the beautiful part of Nike when you're available next. And, um, we duly noted your invitation to visit Canterbury. Um, yeah, do, do. Yeah, get a, get a wee, yeah. wee gang of you. And just lastly, um, I heard from a, a, um, a friend who I hadn't heard from from ages, and she might be in the audience. Her name is Maria Lomprier, and I haven't seen her for a long time. Um, and because I've had a bit of a challenging, and she said she was coming to the talk tonight, and I haven't seen her for years. So if, if Maria is there, hi. Um, I haven't been ignoring you. It's just that I've had a bit of a... a We're just waiting out here. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, hi, hi. Um, yeah, so hi. And to anyone else I, I might know. But um, thank you very much for having me. Good luck. Um, look after yourselves first and then and, you know, let your energy build because um, once you start up this road, it's, it's challenging but it's energising. So and enjoy it. And um, if we can be of any more help, let me know. Thanks very much, Rachel. Big round of applause for uh, Rachel. And Rachel, you look at my appetite, and we're just going to have a little pause now and some pie and cooking that food um, makes us all very happy, so we get got some pie for that. But I'll just a couple of um, brief announcements. And uh, Rachel, if you're happy, if people do have another question either now or in the next few days, and I can choose, I wish I'd ask Rachel that. Please pass them through to us, post them on our Facebook page, or we'll send us an email, and we'll put those up and, and pass them through to Rachel. Just a couple of very small things, I can do. I'll just take some tea. Um, we've just, I just wanted to thank each one of our uh, store holders. So just, obviously, the variety of um, themes around food is incredible. So we've got, uh, we've got the Good District Council talking about loving food and hating, hating, and hating waste here today, and um, how to buy it. We've got food bags talking about um, we've got um, Barbara from the compost talking.